Go to almost any lake or river on a warm day and you'll see them there behind a boat, holding onto a rope and gliding across the water. People out having fun. Or maybe it's you looking back with a smile on your face as you savor the sensation of flying across the surface of the water. The first person to strap on a pair of boards, tie a rope to a boat, and attempt to ski across the water didn't realize the effect it would have on the world. Millions of people around the world now ski, ride, and surf behind boats and at cable parks for the sheer joy of it. And some will push the limits, turning, tricking, jumping, racing, spinning, flipping, grabbing, grinding, flying, and even skiing with no skis at all. In this three-part series, we will look at all towed water sports, highlighting some of the history, innovations, and manufacturing technologies that have helped it become what it is today. Along the way, we'll find out the how and why of these sports by talking with their participants from beginners at family outings to weekend warriors and world record champions. This is Boards on the Water. Who was the first person to invent water skiing? Well, the French thought that they had invented it, along with flying and the telephone. A man named Waller, who actually patented the first water skis, thought he had invented it too. But no, the real credit goes to a resident of Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes. On July 2nd, 1922, on Lake Pepin, Minnesota, 18-year-old Ralph Samuelson was the first person ever to ski on water. Tired of riding an aquaplane, which was tied directly to the boat, Ralph wanted to be able to control where he went while he was being towed. His first attempts to ski using a couple of barrel staves and then a pair of snow skis both met with failure. Realizing he would need more surface area to plane, as his brother's old launch could only do 20 miles per hour, Ralph bought a couple of boards eight feet long and nine inches wide. He used the hot water in his mother's washing machine to soften the wood so he could bend up the tips and then slapped on some white paint and screwed some leather straps to the top to hold his feet. For a handle, he got an iron ring four inches in diameter from the blacksmith and tied it to the boat with 100 feet of sash cord. After many failed attempts, Ralph figured out the position he needed to be in to plane up and out of the water and became the first person to water ski. He would go on to many firsts as he demonstrated his sport to throngs of spectators. During one such demonstration, when he lost a ski crossing the wake, Ralph, always the showman, put his foot down on the remaining ski and finished the show, becoming the first to water ski on a single ski. In July of 1925, a swimming platform propped up on one end and covered with lard became the first water ski ramp as Ralph sailed off it to become the first person to jump on water skis. And a month later, he became the first person to ski behind an airplane at the speed of 80 miles per hour. After a few years of doing the sport he had created, Ralph went on to pursue other interests and left water skiing behind. He never even bothered to patent his creation. Here, the earliest pair of water skis in existence are actually Ralph's second pair, which he made after breaking the first pair jumping awake. Ralph's exploits might have remained in obscurity if not for a reporter, Margaret Crimmins, who discovered the set of skis nailed to the wall of a Lake City boathouse in 1963. After she published a series of articles, the AWSA researched the claim and, in 1966, acknowledged Ralph as the father and Lake City on Lake Pepin as the true birthplace of water skiing. A few years after Ralph began in 1922, across the country and across the Atlantic, others began to start water skiing unaware that anyone else had already tried it. In 1924, Frank Waller of Long Island, New York, would patent the design for the Dolphin Aqua Skis. Like an aquaplane, the skis were tied to the boat and the rider's handle was attached to the tip. 
A showman and promoter, Frank was the first to make moving pictures of water skiing and used stars of the day like Eddie Cantor and Clara Bow to promote the sport. Frank would go on to patent many more of his inventions in the film industry, including Cinerama. And in 1928, his aqua skis would be the first used in organized shows at the Atlantic Steel Pier in Atlantic City, New Jersey. In the same year in the Seattle area, Don Ibsen made his own set of skis and would give birth to water skiing on the West Coast. Another showman and promoter, Don would go on in 1937 to create the Skiquatic Follies at Seward Park in Seattle. This would also become the root of the first water ski club in the United States, the Olympic Water Ski Club. In 1929, at Juan Lepin on the French Riviera, Count Maximilian Pulaski, after straddling two aquaplanes successfully, was inspired to make what he thought was the first set of water skis. His invention would spawn the sport in Europe with the creation of the first water ski club at Juan Lepin. Also in 1929, on the shores of Lake Howard in Winter Haven, Florida, the first trophy for water skiing was awarded to Marvelin Moores Hughes. Winter Haven and the Sunshine State would be forever associated with water skiing. In 1942, Dick and Julie Pope had turned some orange groves into a fledgling garden park on the shore of Lake Gru in Winter Haven, Florida. Some servicemen on leave asked Julie what time the water ski show was. Well, there was no show, but not wanting to disappoint, she told them to come back later that afternoon. Julie gathered her kids and some of their friends and asked them to ride by and do a few tricks on the lake. Well, as the word got out, others came in search of the show. The Popes recruited more skiers and formalized the routines to form what would become the famous Cypress Gardens Water Ski Show. The Popes would do much to promote the sport, literally writing the book on water skiing. Many Cypress Gardens skiers, such as Willa Cook and Dick Pope Jr., would become national and world champions. Through exposure in movies and television, Cypress Gardens would glamorize water skiing and gain notoriety as the water ski capital of the world. Water skiing would expand across the globe after World War II as factories converted back to making consumer goods using technology and production techniques developed during the war. Trailerable powerboats made of aluminum or fiberglass and powered by lightweight outboard motors became an affordable option for families. Millions of people would learn to water ski as skis, like boats, became readily available through mass production. Constructed of wood and later fiberglass, these skis were typically about 67 inches long and had a fin under the tail for added stability. Adjustable bindings allowed one pair to be ridden by skiers of different sizes. A combo pair had an extra rear foot toe plate on one ski that allowed it to be ridden as a single ski. As more people began water skiing, local and national competitions would follow. The American Water Ski Association would become the main sanctioning and organizing body in America for competitive water skiing. Originally formed in 1939, the AWSA would play a large role in the growth and promotion of water skiing. In October of 1951, they produced the first publication devoted to towed water sports, The Water Skier. The magazine is still published seven times a year by USA Water Ski, which now encompasses AWSA, along with sanctioning bodies for several other disciplines. Part of the International Water Ski Federation, USA Water Ski provides sanctioned events, trains and provides judges, scorers and drivers, and certifies tow boats and generally promotes the sport. Located in Polk County, Florida, USA Water Ski shares a home with AWSEF Water Ski Experience Hall of Fame and Museum. Founded in 1968, the American Water Ski Educational Foundation helps to promote and preserve the sport, provides scholarships, and each year one water sports athlete is inducted into the Hall of Fame. The museum is open to the public year-round, and Ralph Samuelson's skis, along with many other historic items, antique equipment, photos, and memorabilia can be found here. Now that we have seen how water skiing came to be, we'll take a look at the variety of disciplines that make up the sport. In part two, we will look at various towed board sports and hydrofoils. And in part three, we will look at barefooting, show skiing, see how skis and boards are made, and talk with families who have made water sports their lifestyle. Up first, disciplines that involve traditional water skis.
As water skiing grew more popular, competitions became more formalized. Three events, slalom, trick, and jump, would become the standards of competitive water skiing. There are tournaments dedicated to each of these disciplines and tournaments that have competitions in all three events. While many skiers choose to specialize in a single event, some, like Jared Llewellyn, would claim world championships as the best overall skier by mastering all three disciplines. Three event or classical skiing is what uh, they call it, is made up of three different disciplines. Slalom, trick, and jump. And uh, when you do all three, you're like a triathlete. You, you end up with an overall score. To understand the difficulty in achieving an overall title, we must first look at each unique discipline individually. I'm Todd Rusticelli, editor of Waterski Magazine. I've been skiing competitively for over 20 years, and I love this sport. So I got my start when my dad one day came home and said, hey, we got a boat. I started skiing when I was 15 years old. There's something special about waking up first thing in the morning and getting on the water, because as a slalom skier, you want great flat conditions. The stillness of the morning, no one else on the water, it's just quiet, you have the mirror reflections going everywhere and it's just you and your friends enjoying the water. And I think just the, the feeling of skiing on smooth water, the pressures that you feel in your feet when you're cutting on glass compared to being on rough water when other boaters are out, it's night and day. It's what every skier wants. Slalom in any sport generally tests the athlete's skill in turning around a set of evenly spaced obstacles. The first water ski slalom competitions involved riding two skis and turning around a set of flags, cones, or large balls placed in a straight line slightly outside of the path of the boat. In the 50s, skiers began using single skis to run slalom. A single ski is more maneuverable, allowing the skier to turn more quickly than on two skis. To increase the challenge, the slalom course was changed to having turned balls on both sides of the boat path. The modern slalom course is 850 feet long and has six balls staggered on alternate sides of the boat's path, which is marked by small buoys. The boat drives a straight line through the course at a constant speed. The course is symmetrical, allowing it to be run from either direction. The skier enters the course through a set of gates on the boat path and attempts to turn around all six balls before skiing through a set of exit gates. Because the distance from the center line of the boat to the turn ball is fixed at 37 feet 8 and 3 quarter inches, the speed and or rope length are adjusted to change the difficulty. Many recreational skiers who may not have had access to a slalom course still enjoy the sensation of riding a slalom ski, carving hard and throwing walls of spray. Skiers first learning to run the slalom course usually start by skiing just inside the turn balls on a long line to learn the timing and rhythm required. Once they succeed, the challenge becomes beating the course at a higher speed or a different rope length. For the pro men, the boat goes 36. For the pro women, 34 miles an hour. And the name of the game is ski as short of a line as possible and round all six buoys. So once you miss a buoy or you fall, then you're done, game over for you if you're in a tournament. As the course evolved, so did the skis. People began modifying the shape, contour, and edges of their wooden skis to enhance their performance. In the 70s, men like Herb O'Brien, Denny Kidder, Jeff Job, and Pat Connolly would incorporate materials and manufacturing techniques from the aerospace industry, such as fiberglass compression molded over honeycomb aluminum or plastic foam cores. Plastics and composites would overtake wood as the dominant material in ski manufacturing. The new lightweight skis would push performance to new levels and change how all future skis and boards would be made. A modern slalom ski is typically 65 to 69 inches long and 7 to 8 inches wide at the forebody, which then tapers to a narrow tail. It has a rocker profile from tip to tail similar to the curve of a banana. Bindings are typically high wrap or hard shell double boots or a single boot and a rear toe plate. The bottom has a concave contour and a large rounded fin with a small wing. Small changes to this fin and wing placement will have a large effect on ski performance. Composition is typically glass or carbon fiber and resin compression molded onto a foam core. Designers can make a ski more responsive or more forgiving by altering the stiffness through a combination of materials used to construct it. So there's six buoys in a slalom course. So once the skier 
completes all six buoys and maxes out at their speed depending on their age division between 32 to 36 miles an hour they start shortening the line. Well eventually the line gets shorter than the reach from the center line of the boat to the buoy and that becomes quite evident at 38 off which is six inches shorter than the reach from the center of the boat to the buoy line. So that's why it helps to be tall. Look at the current world record holder, Chris Parrish. He's 6'5", and he actually skied at a line more than five feet shorter than the reach of the buoy, 43 off, 9.75 meters. So he uses every inch of his body to get the ski around the buoy. As ski performance improved, so did the skiers. While many competed, a small group is responsible for the majority of world slalom records. In the 80s, brothers Chris and Bob LaPointe, along with Mike Shalander, would set new world records many times over. And through the 90s, Brit Andy Mapple would set it nine times. During the same period, his wife Dina Mapple, Jennifer Leachman, Susie Graham, and Christy Overton Johnson would all take multiple turns at setting the women's world record. First world record was set in 1992, and I was blessed to break that, I believe five or six times, uh, ended up holding the world record for 18 years. My father raised me to go out there and beat Christy, to go out there and do the best that I could every time I took to the water and not worry about the competitors because I couldn't control what they did. And, um, you know, the only thing I could do was focus on myself, focus on what I was doing on the water, focus on my training and give it everything that I had. And when I did that, I was never disappointed in my performance, even though maybe I didn't come home with the gold medal. Lake Okahili Park in Palm Beach, Florida is a club site which has hosted many events such as the Water Ski Nationals. With a few tweaks to one of the slalom courses, it can be set up for a truly unique event. Fans on the shore take a break from the Florida sun while the skiers tear up the course at night. Big dog champion, Greg Badon. With lighted boat guides and buoys, the walls of spray illuminated by the lights, the beauty of slalom is highlighted. But slalom is about more than just winning tournaments and setting records. The sensation of carving up the water inspires the passion for the sport. You know, there's nothing that I have ever experienced that compares to running the slalom course. When you go out there, especially in glass calm water, and it's the first set of the day, and it's just like cutting through glass, and, and you just see your reflection in the water, and you're going 60, 70 miles an hour through the wakes, you change your edge, and it's just the most fluid thing, and all of a sudden you're down to like 15, 20 miles an hour, and you're just zipping, and then wham, you're back up again. So in 16.95 seconds, you've gone around six buoys, you've gone from 15, 20 miles an hour to 70 miles an hour in a, in a split second. When someone asks me, how does slalom skiing feel? I tell them, well, for one, it's really fast. There's a lot of forces placed on your body. When you're pulling on the toe line, you can create up to seven, 800 pounds of pressure on the line. So your hands, woo, you can feel it. The more in rhythm you can be with the boat, the better off you're gonna ski. But the feeling of turning in from a wide point on the boat and building your speed approaching the wakes, and then if you maintain your good position, you're nice and balanced on the ski, the swing that you get on the other side of the boat, there's just, there's not a feeling like it in the world. Um, you just build faster, faster into the wake, and then once you release the ski off the second wake, just the, the free feeling, you become more disconnected from the boat. So you're almost like creating this whip of your own and you're free of the boat, the line's not as tight from the boat. And when the ski rolls out and comes underneath you, that carving sensation, it's really good. Slalomitis, there's a lot of slalom addicts out there. And it's all about setting a goal and meeting that goal, and then you always want more. You're never gonna win against the course. It's always gonna beat you because eventually the line's gonna get so short that you're gonna fall or miss a buoy. I see so many skiers out there, they'll get a personal best, and they'll be like, you know what? I could've got a half a buoy more. It's always in the back of your head. The world record at the end, one at 41 off, I had done more in practice, and I just was devastated, really, when my body fell apart because 
I knew that I could do more on the water and it's very addicting. It's very um, slalom skiing. There's one more buoy. There's another quarter buoy, a half buoy. And so that is enough for me to drive me every time to know that you can always go out there and do a little bit better. Addicted to six. You hit it on me on that one because I'm definitely addicted and every day I want to go out there and turn some balls. I got them right in front of my house. I pull people through the course every day teaching them and I can feel every turn everybody makes. And the shorter the rope gets, the faster it goes, the more difficult it is. And if I can go every day and get my six, that is really enough for me. I call it to get addicted to redheads. You know, once you start running that solemn course, it's an addiction that really grabs you. It's hard to, uh, to get away from it. You know, you just want more and more. You want to run better and better runs as you stay with it. You always want an extra buoy, and you'll do whatever it takes to get, get a better score. Oh, I've been doing it for 50 years, and, and there's people that just, you know, in their 80s and older who keep wanting to run a slalom course. It's that addictive. Even if you don't have a slalom course, to get out there and to make a lot of cuts bright and early in the morning with the sun busting the, busting the water and you can just hit this perfect calm water and just make these cuts across there it is one of the greatest feelings in the world of swinging back and forth behind that boat through those waves. Skiers looking to compete in three event skiing must learn to master the trick ski. Trick skiing involves performing various maneuvers such as riding backwards, spinning, stepping over the rope, and even flipping while riding a short, finless ski. Unlike slalom and jump, which rely on strength, trick skiing is all about finesse and control. The sport evolved as skiers in shows began cutting down longer skis and removing the fins to make skis that could be spun on the surface of the water and ridden backwards. Skiers began dropping a ski and doing tricks on a single ski. Always looking for ways of wowing the crowd with new tricks, the first toe holds were made back in the 40s, allowing a skier to ride hands-free. The modern trick ski is designed to be used either with both feet on the ski or with only one foot and a toe hold. A trick ski has a single high wrap boot type binding and an angled rear toe plate. The ski is typically 40 inches long and 11 inches wide. Composition is glass or carbon fiber and resin compression molded over a foam core. The top has a smooth bevel down to a sharp edge. Sharp edges are necessary to control the ski as the bottom is usually completely smooth with no fins to allow it to slide and spin on the surface of the water. The trick ski has no fins on the bottom. It's completely smooth and um, you know it slides like you're on ice skates for the very first time. That's pretty much what it feels like. You control the ski by you know standing on it totally evenly and by with your with your ankles and your knees and your hips that's what you basically control the ski with you try to leave your upper body as still as possible and then just work the the lower body to make the ski do the things you want it to do it's just an incredible combination of balance and and body strength and and just it's just being the total master of your body you can you know you, if your body is just 10 degrees off you're gonna fall so it's just really, really hard to make that ski do exactly what you want it to and do the flips and the spins that you're, you're about to do. It just took so much time practicing. Uh, you're looking at 20, 30 minute sets over and over, falling, hitting your head against the water. You don't learn tricks the first time. And I've had people ask me, you know, have you ever fallen? Well, my goodness, I fell every single day and I fell every time I was trying something new. As skiers improved, trick competitions settled on a specific format. Skiers submit a list to judges beforehand of the tricks they will do in each of two 20 second long passes. One while holding the handle with the hands and the other while holding the handle with the foot inserted into a toe hold. Judges in the boat or on shore then score the runs. More difficult tricks, such as spinning while crossing the wake, stepping over the rope, or flipping, are worth more points. At certain tournaments, like the Masters, the scoring has gone high tech. The trick event is actually judged, we have five judges. There is a video taken from the boat view, and they watch that view on monitors. And then each trick has a specific point value. The, each skier has 20 seconds 
in two directions, so they get two passes of 20 seconds, and you only get credit for a trick at one time. You may do it more than once, but you only get credit for it one time. And you must get credit or no credit on a three to five ratio from the judges. As in slalom, some skiers have specialized in trick competition. One tricker, Corey Picos, dominated men's tricks for over two decades, setting 24 world records and 30 national records in the process. As a trick skier, one of my heroes was Corey Picos. Corey actually would come and train me as a young child. He was, he was about 10 years older than me, and, and he was the Michael Jordan of the trick ski event. He was incredible, still is incredible, held the world records for decades. Tricks is, is a hard one, you know, because you fall and it's all over. I mean, even if you have two 20-second passes, but even if you fall in one, you know you're going to be out of the game. So um, you got to make sure before you go out, you know exactly what you're doing. You have your run set up, and obviously the higher the point value, the harder the trick, the higher the point value. So you're going to put your hardest tr uh, tricks in your run. Um, usually you do one hand run and you have your flips and spins in that one and the second run you actually attach the toe piece to your foot and you don't hold the rope in your hand, you actually have it wrapped around your foot. There is a release person in the boat that will release the rope from the boat in case you fall because otherwise you have no way of getting out. And what was really unique is that you had to you had to prepare your runs before you got to the event. You knew exactly what you were going to go do. You had to write down on paper and give to the judges what you were going to do. And so when you got to an event, all you could do was what you could do. And there was nothing like going out and doing two perfect runs and coming in with your hair still dry. That was my favorite thing about tricks. You didn't even have to get wet. Since Ralph Samuelson's first flight off a ramp, Jumping on water skis has always been seen as a bit of a daredevil activity, making it a popular staple in ski shows and even in movies and television. In shows, skiers use the ramp to execute aerial tricks, while in competition, the focus is on who can travel the farthest given a fixed boat speed and ramp height. Jump ramps are made of fiberglass on a floating aluminum frame with protective skirts on the sides. Surface dimensions are typically 14 feet wide, 21 feet long, and five and a half feet tall. Unlike the wood ramp that Ralph Samuelson skied over that required lard for lubrication, a modern ramp is waxed and uses water to make it slippery. Speeds vary by competitive class, but are typically in the range of 32 to 35 miles per hour. As with the slalom and trick event, course and ramp dimensions, along with boat speed, are monitored closely to ensure that all competitors get equal conditions. Jump skis are very specialized, longer and thicker than regular skis. Competition jump skis are typically 80 to 92 inches long and seven to eight inches wide. Special angled tips curve away from the line of the ski and are also gently curved up from the bottoms. Each ski has a high wrap boot type binding and composition is typically carbon fiber and resin compression molded over honeycomb aluminum for strength, stiffness, and light weight. The bottoms are flat with sharp square edges and shallow fins. The skis are designed to allow a hard cut into the ramp to be stable while in the air and to absorb the high impacts of the landing. Skiers typically wear a helmet and a wetsuit, often covered by a thin windsuit that lowers air drag, allowing them to slip through the air easier and fly further. Besides specialized equipment, Ski jumping requires individuals willing to hit a solid ramp at speeds upwards of 60 miles per hour. One such skier is longtime competitor and coach, the Rocket Man Scott Ellis. You'll notice in, in jumping, we have uh, these monster skis. And of course, we got to wear a helmet. We wear a jumpsuit, protects our ribs, uh, lots of flotation in case we do get, you know, unfortunately get knocked out or something, we will float. And one of the most important piece of equipment is the arm sling. Uh, you'll see it's a, it's a belt that goes around our waist with a loop that we actually put our arm into. And the reason we wear that is we generate so much speed and so much uh, pull from the boat that if our arms get separated from our body and we hit the ramp like that, we will flip. We will crash 100%. So by keeping that arm in, the, that arm in your arm sling and keeping your body or your arms close to your body, you can withstand tons of pounds of pressure from the boat and get a lot, all your lift off the top of the ramp. There's a lot of steps to take when I take a jump. Um, the, main, the main things is one, before the boat turns around, 
I get focused. I put my hands on the handle, I look at the boat judge, make sure everything's okay. Once that boat makes its turn and starts going into the course, I look all the way down to the ramp, um, even into the landing area. I check the wind. Um, I make sure there's nothing in the water, this, you know, cups, bottles, whatever, and no turtles. Sometimes turtles get on the ramp. Uh, once everything's clear, I cut out to the 600, which is a, a distance, like a measuring distance buoy that's 600 feet from the ramp. So I can adjust my cut to the ramp based on the wind from that buoy. Pull out, get as wide as I can beside the boat. You know, the boat goes a constant speed of 35, and I'm, I'm racing beside it, keeping my speed. So I'm going 35, 38 when I decide to make my turn to the ramp. And then once I do, I focus on my target. That ramp's only 14 feet wide. Uh, I have very little room for error. Uh, that, that window of opportunity is very small. I'm going nearly 70 miles an hour. So I make sure everything's locked in. Um, and, and there's one important thing that I always remember or I think about is I keep my handle down low, which keeps my center of gravity low and keeps me from moving. And then I just hang on and hit that ramp and fly as far as I can. The feeling of jumping is incredible. Um, we, we, you know, we're going on a, on a flat surface nearly 70 miles an hour. We hit a ramp and in an instant we're shooting almost three stories high. And it's, it's fear, it's adrenaline, it's everything. It's, it's incredible. I mean, next time you're on the road, stick your head out the window and you're going 70 miles an hour and then imagine in a half a second you shoot up 20 feet. Like it's, uh, it's incredible. I still get, a, I'm like getting goosebumps talking about it. Like I love it. It's incredible. Like many pro water skiers, Scott coaches other up and coming athletes, but who do the pros turn to for help? In a sport that has very few people able to jump over 200 feet, the skiers must help each other. Other sports, you don't see competitors helping each other out or training together. Um, just today, for instance, uh, I'm getting ready for the Moomba Masters in Australia. Um, the top jumper in the world, Freddy Krueger, came out today and we jumped together. We, you know, dissected a little bit here and there and it's, uh, it's cool. We'll go to a tournament and I might say, hey, Fred, can you watch me real quick? We all help each other out. If equipment breaks, we rush over there and help them fix it. It's comforting to travel like that, knowing that you don't have your competitors behind you ready to stab you in the back. Here in water skiing, it's a very unique sport to where the top people in the world help each other out. My favorite event is the jump event. Pulling out, you're pumped and you whip across and that, that is the whip style to get up on the boat as far as you can so that uh, you, you can create angle, create load on the boat. When your adrenaline is just pumping and racing when you start cutting to the ramp and you feel all that tension in your, in your arms and hands and legs and, and then the impact just to keep your direction, it, it just folds you on the ramp and then to come off the ramp and feel the wind under your skis and they come up and you just press up over them. It's an unbelievable feeling. And, I mean, 200 feet's nice, but when you start in 230, 240 feet, it's just, it's just mind-boggling, and it, it's the reason why every, every time you land, you want to turn the boat and go down to the other end of the lake and just hit another, a bigger jump. You know, the difficulty of three-event skiing is, is that people don't understand is all three events are, are really different from each other. Trick skiing, you got to be limber and you're spinning and your hips and your core is getting all, all tight and then jumping, it's just your, your hips are getting tight from hitting the ramp and, and then you go out and slalom and it just jerks you around and um, to balance your body and to be able to um, adjust those different events and go into a tournament, it's a much huge bigger uh, lead up to a tournament you have to plan and, and, and work yourself up so that you don't overtrain. and just to keep your body intact and hit that event and peak for that event is why overall is undoubtedly the hardest event to do. Skiers win awards by competing in various events categorized by gender and age group. For competitive skiers the goal is to progress through the local and regional tournaments and ultimately compete in national or world competitions. One of the longest running and most prestigious three event tournaments is the Masters. Unlike the Nationals and World events which are held in different locations year to year, the Masters has a permanent home. Every Memorial Day weekend for over 50 years, Callaway Gardens has hosted the tournament on this specially built site. Since 1959, the world's best have skied in front of large crowds seated in a one of a kind pavilion along the shore of Robin Lake. Over the past 50 years, the Masters has evolved. It started out as a water ski tournament, and over the years that wakeboarding was added, and then junior um, water skiers and wakeboarders were added too. 
These are non-professional, usually teenagers that uh, compete on an amateur basis. This event's been going on for over 50 years and it's the most prestigious water ski event in the world. The world's top athletes want to be here and compete and only the top athletes are allowed in. It's an invitation only event. And we also have a selection committee that sets a criteria. So the criteria is very firm on who gets to compete here because it's only the top skiers in the world, both junior and the pro skiers. The highlight for every water skier is to get an invitation to the U.S. Masters Water Ski and Whiteboard event. The Masters is a special tournament, you know, when you get your first invitation, it's such a thrill because it is one you have to be invited to, you can't just sign up for it and go. My first invitation, I'll never forget, came in 1983, I was 13 years old. It was my first invitation to ski against the big dogs of the sport, to get to ski in international competition. I was blessed throughout my career to win um, eight Masters titles, two trick titles, and six slalom titles. Every person in our Water Ski Hall of Fame has been to that tournament. Um, they've walked in that dock, they've skied behind those boats, they've jumped over that ramp. And for me to be included in that big of a category or those, you know, to me, famous people is incredible. Like, you know, I used to chase them around trying to get autographs. You know, like, you know, Wayne Grimnage, Ricky McCormick, Sammy Duvall, like it's, and then for me to be there and then to be on the water and then to hear the crowd scream and yell, it's absolutely incredible. I do a lot of contests during the year and one that really just sticks out and um, means a lot to me is the uh, Masters. And actually after my injury of breaking my leg, that my goal was to come back and have the first contest I compete in um, at the Masters. Um, I took second, but just to even be back riding and to know that I made it and I'm here to stay and I'm going to continue competing is, was way better than winning any event. Being invited to the Masters is, is an amazing thing. My feeling like overall is, is the most ultimate title to win and the, and the and overall at the Masters was the pinnacle of the sport and I've done that uh, five times and won the jump event but the overall titles have always come back and everything that I've done in the sport have been very special to me. And the Masters has changed over the years and there's different elements and the overall is not there so that's a little disappointing to me and I, I would hope that they would bring it back. So what does it take to put on a large tournament like the Masters? It takes a lot, of, a lot of different people. It takes a big commitment from sponsors to be able to put on an event of this magnitude. But it's also all the volunteers that it takes. We have judges, drivers, dock starters, announcers. Then just making sure all the technical. Technical is huge here with our wireless camera feed so that we can do the proper judging. And it's monumental. <laughs> The custom site, hard work by the staff and volunteers, along with top-level competition between the world's elite skiers, make the Masters one of the best water sports venues for spectators. There's a real international flavor to the Masters. The competitors come from all over the world. In fact, many of the competitors in both the water ski and wakeboard come from outside the United States. And many people travel here from around the world to visit this event, too. We have people I've talked to already today from Germany, Switzerland, various places that come here uh, much of the water ski and wakeboard world comes to Georgia each Memorial Day to see these uh, fine athletes compete, and we're having a great weekend. While three-event skiing is still popular worldwide, it does not receive the media attention it did in the 1980s when a fledgling cable sports network put water skiing in prime time. Dina Brush, Sammy Duvall, and his sister Camille would all become known for their domination as all-around skiers. I grew up in the professional circuit in the late 80s and the 90s, which was when water skiing was in its prime. Uh, we were on hot summer nights on ESPN every Tuesday night uh, during the summer. Not only that, but there was finances in the sport. So you had sponsors, you had uh, cash prize tournaments, and you could really make a living at the sport. In the mid-90s, the economy kind of turned and things um, started, sponsors started pulling out of the water sports industry. And uh, it was really a kind of a sad time. But what's amazing about our athletes is they don't do this for the money. They do this because they absolutely love it. Because there's, I don't think any athletes now in our sport 
that uh, are making a lot of money. They may be um, making enough to get by, but most of them have to supplement it with water ski schools and, and things like that. But they do it because of the love for the sport and the love for the people. Another sport that has a tight-knit community and has been around a long time is ski racing. The southwestern desert is known by most people for its rugged, unforgiving terrain and hostile environment. This arid land is not a place most would consider a hotbed for water sports. But here on the Colorado River, below the dam that creates Lake Havasu, is an area known as the Parker Strip. This section of river on the border of Arizona and California is an oasis that attracts many boaters, skiers, and boarders. It is also home each year to the U.S. Open Ski Racing Championships, an event that combines water skiing with the high energy sound and speed of powerboat racing. Let's watch this turn. No, 110 goes a little wide. Oh, it just soaks down. No, boat 19. Welcome to Outboard. Sells the battle going on in these flights, ladies and gentlemen. This is a great, great F2 race. So what is ski racing? Skiers ride a heavy single ski behind a powerboat and race other skiers and boats at high speeds, trying to be the first skier to cross the finish line. Hi, I'm uh, Gary Heinbuck. I'm president of the National Water Ski Racing Association. And we're here at the uh, U.S. Open Water Ski National Championships at Parker, Arizona. Our speeds exceed, for the elite skiers, well over 100 miles an hour. Uh, today, actually, we were in the, in the men's race, they were running anywhere between 106 and 110 miles an hour. The women run between 95 and 100. It all depends on water conditions. Today, here, it's fairly smooth, and that helps the skier, and it helps the boat speeds, and, and people could go a lot faster. In, rougher water conditions, you have to slow down. Uh, some, some of the juniors, they'll go anywhere from 60 miles an hour and, and they'll go up to the senior men and senior women, which run over 100. We have different age classes and the classes start with a zero to nine, zero to 12, uh, depends upon who's here and the participants. And it goes all the way up to 13 to 15 and, and the teenagers 16 to 20. 21, 29, uh, 30, 36, and they, they go both for men and women. We have classes that are boat classes also, which is a, a stock boat, a jet boat, an outboard, Formula One, Formula Two. We have it in the rules where if you win any one of your respective classes, then you can go ahead and ski in the men's or women's open. And those are the elite skiers. Now, um, before any event, we have a boat inspection for safety. We have designated boat inspectors that check the boats for fire extinguishers, flare guns, radios, steering cable tightness, rudder certificates, anything that can help our rescue boats that are on the water. Uh, in fact, we can't have a ski race without it, the rescue boats being on the water. But all of our boats are thoroughly inspected prior to going into the race. And we have a driver's meeting every morning. And as we call roll call, every driver that's here has to turn in their inspection form. We do not let them out of the water without an inspection form. Now, separately, the skiers have their own safety equipment. Uh, it's, it's not mandatory, but we highly recommend helmets, neck collars, arm restraints, helmet restraints, flotation wetsuits, and all of this is in case a skier falls, it prevents the injuries to the neck and to the brachial plexus and to the arms. Besides specialized safety gear, the equipment used in ski racing is optimized for endurance skiing at high speeds. A racing ski is much longer and less tapered than a slalom ski. 
A set of dual high wrap bindings provide a solid connection and ankle support. Unlike a slalom ski, which is ridden on its edge while turning, a racing ski is designed to be stable while riding flat in a straight line. A flat bottom design with no rocker, square edges, and a shallow fin is used. Construction is generally laminated wood for high strength and heavy weight, which helps absorb shock. Multiple layers of tape are wrapped around the ankles to provide support required to endure the pounding long runs. The ropes are more than twice the length of a standard ski rope, ranging from 150 to as much as 200 feet. Instead of a handle, a harness is used to transfer the pull from the skier's arms and hands to the torso. The harness wraps around both sides to the back and is held closed with one hand while the other hand remains on the rope. Water ski racing follows two circuits. We, have, uh, we break it into a circle race and marathons. And a circle race, we have more categories in age group there, and we run smaller laps. We'll run like a two mile lap, and it'll be a designated amount of laps, like one lap or two laps or three, depending upon your age and the, um, the experience of that class. Then we have what we call the marathon series, and a marathon series is what qualifies the team members to go to be on the U.S. team to represent the United States in the World Championships. The men will ski for one hour plus a lap, the women ski for 45 minutes plus a lap, and the juniors ski for 30 minutes plus a lap. To avoid crowding in the marathon races, classes of skiers are separated into flights that leave in 30 second intervals. Here at Parker, the boats start at the Blue Water Resort and will travel seven and a half miles upriver before turning back. The team's skills are tested on a variety of curves and straightaways as the river winds through the desert past homes, RV parks, and campgrounds. A large buoy marks the far end of the course where the teams turn to head back. The fastest teams, racing at over 100 miles per hour, can complete a 15 mile loop in just nine minutes. The open men's classes will ski 90 miles in just under one hour. Unlike other towed water sports competitions that use a single boat, driver, and observer for all competitors in a discipline, ski racing is a team competition. The team consists of the boat, a driver, an observer, and a skier or skiers. Hi, my name is Mike Avila, 2002 inductee of the Water Ski Hall of Fame, seven-time marathon men's open champion, eight-time men's open sprint championship, uh, four-time national champion driver. Um, been doing it since my 41st straight year. The boat is actually one of the most important pieces of equipment that we have. But, uh, different ski boats have different powers. It goes anyway from, from uh, traditional outboards with 300 horsepower on them or 250 horsepower. Then we have twin turbocharged boats with 1200 horsepower, blown Chevys that can range from 900 to 1000 horsepower. Um, really it's your preference. The difference between this and a normal boat is uh, this has a foot throttle. It also has all the trim, all the trim indications on your hands, on your feet, um, hydraulic steering. This boat here, it's got it's uh, two blown Chevys in it. They, uh, it makes about 1,950 horsepower. Uh, it's a very unique piece in a 21 footer. There's really no other one like this. It's a very very high performance piece of equipment. It uh, takes a lot to drive. The driver, his part of the of the team, is very very critical. His, uh, he's got to control the boat. With, you know, when you're pulling a skier 100 miles an hour, you really, just driving a boat 100 miles an hour is very difficult, but to uh, drive it and try to keep the water skier up, upright is uh, extremely difficult. My name is Marshall Cole. I'm 25 years old. I've been water ski racing since I was six years old. Did my first race up in Lake Arrowhead, California. Been doing it every year since then. Uh, competed both nationally and internationally in various world championship competitions. You got Marshall Cole, load number 26 on the inside, but we'll have 43. Going over 100 miles an hour on a water ski is definitely like 
nothing else uh, I've ever experienced. Um, it's pretty hard to compare anything to it. Uh, we tell a lot of people to maybe stick your head out of a car window when you're going over 100 and that'll give you somewhat of a sensation, but uh, it's pretty hard to compare it to anything else between the drag that you get on the ski and the intensity of being in the race behind a boat that has the capability of pulling you over 100 miles an hour. Uh, it's definitely like nothing else, but you always have to be concentrating and searching for the best water behind the boat throughout the race. Um, some of our races are w over an hour long and you know you have to be in shape to do it and have the mental endurance to stay in the race and push yourself to uh, go the fastest you can go depending on the water conditions. Hi, my name is Mike King. Uh, I've been ski racing for 30 years. Um, probably one of the biggest misconceptions of ski racing is uh, the observer's role, something that I've been doing and truly enjoy. Um, a lot of people that ask me about ski racing assume that uh, the winner is just going to be whoever has the fastest boat. And it's just not necessarily true. It's all uh, skier's ability and the part the observer plays in is getting the most out of them as you can. Uh, one of the key things in ski racing is always communication. Uh, and there's two forms of it that go on uh, in the, during the race. One between the observer and the uh, skier, which is all going to be based on uh, hand signals from the skier, um, signals of encouragement from the observer back to the skier, information on how many more laps to run, how much time is left in the event. And you have to have a relationship with your observer the guy who watches you, that's like no other because he sh the observer should be able to tell if you can go faster or go slower without you having to tell him and the more efficient the two of you are at that, the more efficient the observer is with the driver. One of the other forms of communication that goes on during ski race is a verbal discussion between the uh, observer and the driver. Uh, we've got headsets now where we can talk, uh, ask more direct questions of what's happening during the race as far as the driver to move out a lane, in a lane, uh, fast or slower. The driver also gets to know the skier to the point where he can slow down or speed up knowing what kind of water the skier can go through and so between the driver, observer and skier it really is the best team that's going to win a race. Well my name's Donna Bozeman and I'm Colleen Bormans. Uh, I'm a skier and she's my observer. And basically, I got into skiing um, about four months ago. A friend of mine asked me if I want to be on a ski team. I said, sure. And then uh, I just met Bob over here, my driver, at the sandbar here in Parker. And he said he'd pull me. So there was my driver and my observer in one afternoon. And I've just kind of been training the last few months. Um, my first actual ski race was Puddingstone. I started skiing a couple years ago, did my first race out here, and um, started observing um, for an Australian, and now I'm observing for her, and I actually like sitting in the boat a little bit more. It's more of a rush, and it's a little bit easier on my body. Um, it's fun, it's an adrenaline rush when the flag drops, just take off and hold on and start talking to my driver about what the boats are doing and how's my skier looking. and trying to stay, stay strong through the whole race. It's fun. Um, pretty much they can agree with me that racing is an addiction. I've just been in it for about five months and I will be in it for as long as uh, my body will let me. Rosalie Johnson Kinslow and I've been doing this since I was about nine years old. I got into it through my uncle from skiing up in Clear Lake and I've been doing it ever since. I'm now almost 40. I ski behind Mike Avila which does the 211 boat and the 110 and my parents actually or my mom raced with Mike's mom and dad back in Monterey in the ocean when they raced ocean racing. So I've been skiing behind Mike now since I was probably almost 13 years old, and I'm still doing it today. And now all three of my girls are doing it, so I'm staying in it, starting from young to old. So that's my daughter, Sydney Kinslow, and she's skiing 0 to 12 for the first time, and she's skiing 0 to 12, and that's Cassie Kinslow. And this is my oldest daughter, Shelby Kinslow, who's skiing junior girls, and we'll also be racing against each other here 
in the next two races. But I enjoy the heck out of it. As with other water sports competitions, it takes many people to make an event like this possible. Volunteers are responsible for organizing and operating the event, manning the safety boats, and timing and scoring the competitors. Their dedication, along with the boat teams and fearless skiers, help make ski racing the fastest sport on water. Probably the best known water skier of all is Twiggy the Water Skiing Squirrel. Famous around the world for over 30 years, Twiggy appeals to the kid and everyone. We got the first Twiggy back in 1978 when she was blown out of her nest after a hurricane. We took her in and raised her and after we had her for a little while, my husband bought our daughter this little remote control boat for her birthday. Well then he got teased so much for buying her this boat and then he played with it all the time. So he figured he better come up with another excuse for driving the boat. So he just said, well I have to learn to drive it so I can teach my squirrel to water ski with it. And that's where the idea came from. It was totally a joke. My husband, he was a nut and he was always inventing things. So he made Twiggy some skis out of styrofoam. Then we started working with her in the water and before long she was water skiing. Well then the local newspaper, well they ended up doing the first newspaper story on Twiggy and that went in the paper in May of 1979. About a week later, the Orlando Sentinel picked it up. Then it hit the UBI circuit. It went all over the world in newspapers. This is Twiggy number seven that I'm working with today. Um, and I, my daughter Tabitha, she's also on the road with her Twiggy uh, doing shows now. My husband passed away in a boating accident in 1997. So I've ended up incorporating water safety into the show. Twiggy wears a life vest. We encourage everyone to learn to swim, learn to float, wear your life jackets, and practice water and boating safety when you're around the water. So Twiggy's on a mission. We, we hope to make a difference with our water safety message. Next time in part two of Boards on the Water, we will focus on kneeboarding, hydrofoiling, wakeboarding, wake skating, and wake surfing. Want more? Go to the WDSE TV 15 channel on YouTube. There you'll find all three episodes of Boards on the Water, along with other local documentaries and programs produced by WDSC TV.